What's up, Minivan Movie Club? It is your hosts, the ultimate Nick Wiggum with the amazing... Rick Ray, baby. Yes, sir. I'm here. If you can't tell, we've got a little bit of Spider-Man flair today for this week's episode. Uh, we had a super, super awesome uh, weekend. We started it off the best way that anybody can, and that's by going to see a great movie. Yes. Uh, spoiler alert, we enjoyed it. Uh, Across the Spider-Verse, highly recommend. Do not walk to go see this movie. Drive in your minivan or swing there uh, if you are Spider-Man. Uh, and if you have not gotten over your biases, watch Into the Spider-Verse first. Just give it a shot. Sit at home. You can watch it by yourself if you don't want your friends to make fun of you for watching animated movies <laughs> as an adult. Uh, that's okay. You know, it, I think COVID got a lot of people over that. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of people got into anime. A lot of professional athletes are into it now. So I think we're starting to kind of move past that uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, and so... Us with kids, it's a little more acceptable. But even if you don't have kids, go watch a sweet animated movie. Uh, enjoy it. Uh, but that leads me into where I actually want to start us off. We hit 50 subscribers uh, this last week. Boom, shakalaka! YouTube, so we're halfway there. We're halfway to our goal. We've still got our giveaway uh, movie on the mini. All you have to do is like and subscribe to our YouTube page, all, that's all you have to do. You're entered. If you're super in the first simple. 100, it's super simple. Hop on in to the minivan with us. Um, follow us on on Spotify as well. Follow us on Facebook. But the only way that you get an entrance into the competition is on our YouTube page. Yep, that's for real. Um, so we're super appreciative of, of those first 50 out there. It's uh, 50, and we're, we're really excited for our, our, our gold button that we're getting from YouTube for that yeah. 50. I think they send you the gold one for 50. And then uh, like a like half a Bitcoin for, for oh, 100. Oh, dang. So there we I'm, go. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Half a bitty. Yeah, so, so I know I know it sounds like we're being silly, but for the 50 of people that have subscribed and to the hundreds of thousands of more coming in the future. To the millions watching at home. We appreciate you. Yes, we really do appreciate you. It's been fun. It's been a journey. We've learned a ton about ourselves, what we want to do with the show. Yep. Uh, and it just it excites us for what's going to happen in the future. So that leads us into our super simple streaming suggestions uh, for the week. Uh, right now, we don't have any video, but we'll add that in. Yeah, add it. Post. Um, so to start out with, I've got one. The, the movie this week is Across the Spider-Verse and a movie that has some nice little uh, Spider-Man connections due to the same actors is Scream Part 6. It is on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, if you enjoy the previous Screams, this takes it up a notch. They're in New York City. Uh, the, the, the kills are brutal. It's a lot of fun. So our second super simple streaming suggestion is is one that you have mentioned in the past. I'm going to double dip. We mentioned it for some of the video game movies that we've done in the past, but I really want you to go check out Arcane on Netflix. It's a League of Legends story, but the animation style is so cool, and it's just a reminder that animation is a medium. It's not an age demographic. It's not just for children. And the same way that Into the Spider-Verse is not just a children's movie and across a spider verse is so much more than that go check it out you'll you'll do yourself a favor it's eight episodes and they're about 30 45 minutes a piece check it out on netflix another one that i i was recommended to me by my good buddy jared pig shout out jared pig he's a listener uh he recommended the terminal list on Amazon Prime, it stars a very familiar Marvel actor and Chris Pratt. Uh, he's on a mission. He's got a terminal list of people to kill, and it's a lot of fun. So highly recommend the terminal list. Uh, check it out if you're looking for It's only one season, eight episodes, but if you're just kind of looking for something uh, to kind of escape for a few hours, it's a good, a good watch. Do you have another? Nope, I'm good. All right, that leads me to our final suggestion, which is going to be uh, looking forward into next week's episode. We are going to cover Avatar The Way of Water. This is actually dropping on two different streaming platforms uh, this week. It's going to drop on Max, uh, formerly HBO Max, and uh, Disney+. Plus. I know Disney+, Plus. it comes out on 
June 7th. So by the time you listen to this episode, it should already be streaming. Uh, so watch that so you can you know follow along with us. And I believe the first one is also already on Disney+. Plus. So if you need a, a recap because it came out in 2012. Yeah, if you haven't oh. caught on, one of the things we're trying to do this summer is give you your own little bit of movie marathons. We did the Spider-Man movie marathon in the past. We've got some other movies coming out this summer that lend itself very easily to be able to watch multiple movies. You've got the Flash movie, Indiana Jones, Avatar. There's so many good movies coming out this summer that just lead you to be able to watch so many other movies. And when you're in the Minivan Movie Club, take a ride with us this summer. Come take a show with us. Watch all these different movies that lead into one movie, and it makes it so much more enjoyable because you understand the Easter eggs, the references, but more importantly, you understand some of like the themes that dig into all of them. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, one of the one of the things me and Brett had watched, there was an interview with the Russo brothers, and they talked about one of the hardships of movies is getting you to really be invested in the characters over a short form, form medium, so like two hours. So nothing really boosts your attachment to these characters like going back and watching some of the older stories that also include them uh, and then you you really feel invested uh, sort of like you would feel invested if you had watched a full season with one of these characters well, it's, it's funny too as we transition into our discussion about this specific movie into the spider-verse or across the spider-verse i'm going to keep messing that up just for anyone who's listening know that i'm talking about both the first and the second in installment in this series we just watched every single spider-man movie since 2002 we enjoyed some of them. We didn't enjoy some of them. But even though the characters that we were speaking of aren't at all in these movies, they're referenced. Different alternate versions of them are referenced. And so it immediately puts you into the universe. You're seeing different versions of characters, different references and Easter eggs. And it made me, and I'm not someone that's familiar with the comic book that Miles Morales' character comes from. I know he's a much more recent character, you know, 15 17 years, not like Peter Parker, who's got bases all the way trailing back to Stan Lee. But I still cared about these movies. I still cared about the the stakes and yeah. everything there. So that, I think that's a really cool thing. And I'm, I would be lying if I said that streaming culture had infected me, where being able to watch the whole season of Stranger Things and binge all of House of Cards, binge all of Game of Thrones, that's fun. So being able to watch nine movies before I watch a movie... That's fun to me, and I know there are plenty of people out there that say, I'm not going to see that movie in theaters. I'll wait till it hits streaming. So start watching these nine movies now. Start watching these two movies. You don't have to, but if you want to, start watching those movies, and then when this hits Max or Disney Plus or Paramount Plus, then you're, you're good to go. And you already have that that built up and it's it's so hard we talk about it all the time and that's why we have the super simple streaming suggestions is uh just the ability to not really have to think about what you're going to watch be like oh i've already got this you know these guys have recommended it uh, i trust their opinions they're super smart and good looking uh, and they know exactly handsome. what they're talking about handsome great facial hair great facial structure thank you um that was all about Brett, not me. And so we we wanted to bring it to to you guys and really create this community where we can all just kind of feed off of each other and watch things and get recommendations and just kind of keep that excitement going. Yeah, so if you've got any streaming suggestions, feel free to comment them in the section in the comments below. Let us know the things that you're interested in because while the suggestions we have kind of tr we try to theme them somewhat into either what's timely and, and present, but also things that are you know, really relevant to the material that we're sourcing in this specific episode. So comment below, what are your streaming suggestions for other people as we're thinking about people, others in the Minivan Movie Club? Yep, so we're going to hop into the backseat breakdown. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than your traditional breakdown that you get uh, across other podcasts and YouTube videos. We're not going to go through every story beat uh, and tell you everything that happens. We expect that you've already seen the movie, so you already know kind of where they go. But it's a little bit more about breaking down themes and, and scenes that we particularly enjoyed and some things that maybe we would want to change about the movie. So hopping into it, um, what was you know kind of the big universal theme that you take away from Across the Spider-Verse? It's a good question. I think there's a couple of things, and without giving too much away, I think part of this movie, because it's part one, not a full movie, uh, this isn't a trilogy. This is going to be like one movie and a mega movie. one mega movie that split into two parts. 
Uh, so I think that there's some move. There's some themes that when you see the second part, you'll be able to digest better. Yeah. Because you'll see the finality of there. But in this movie specifically, there's definitely a huge theme about family. And you and I were talking about how there's something about family in so many superhero movies, comic book movies. They always tie with stories about family. And Spider-Man, having just gone through this, also has a legacy of having important familiar characters, whether it is Aunt May, Uncle Ben, the best friend, whomever that person is. And in this movie, we get to see a different version of that. We didn't really get to see much of Miles' mom in the first End of the Spider-Verse. We were obviously aware of who she was, and it explored much more of the father-son dynamic. So it was kind of cool to see that because... In most other movies with Spider-Man, we don't get to ex- experience the parents at all. No. So, and if we do in like The Amazing Spider-Man, it's much more from the perspective of Richard Parker and Peter Parker, the father-son relationship. So I did think that that was very cool. Obviously, there is some like demographic diversity there with her being uh, from like Latin America of descent as opposed to like a, a white woman or a black woman. Uh, him having like a multicultural diversity, being both black and Latin American, there's something to be explored there. But there's also just this thought of like time travel and like the ripple effect of how one action can cause a ripple effect on tons of other things. And I don't want to give away too much of a discussion today, but I definitely felt like they were setting up something there of how one small change, one small thing can make. A devastating difference. It's really funny, like hopping into this movie after just doing Back to the Future and yes. seeing like the the family ties that because when you have such a like heady sci fi theme that your movie's surrounded by, you need a way to grab to have some gravity for your audience to be rooted in the characters, so it's just not so out there. Uh, and I think that's why they're pulling from family so hard, particularly in this one. Uh, they do such a good job with the opening uh, scenes to get you to spend time with Miles's parents. So you really feel as the story goes on that you want to save them just as much as Miles yep. wants to yep. save them. Uh, and it really leads to that like conflicting interest because we know traditional Spider-Man format, uh, which is what Miguel O'Hara explains to him through canon events, uh, which, by the way, can we just get like a super elegant MCU movie to just show us like, this is the the way time works in our, our thing and just like super simple breakdown of it. And that way we have some numbers and dates and things like that (laughs) where it's like, this is like, okay, this is how time works. The, the multiverse works in spider verse. It makes sense easy enough to put on a so is the screen I, i'm i know i reference we've we've talked about a couple things over and over again lots of mcu stuff lots of dr strange we've even referenced some rick and morty does the spider like verse like is that outside of time is that like the tva or is that like another place is that like the citadel of rick's where like sits outside of time well they where, started out i don't like i don't a, know or branching. is that like is that the future I, I don't know. Well, they started out with like the branching, like we get in Loki, but then it's like then you get the spider web, and then so it's like, well, I don't think everybody's connected to the spider web, so is that just like their own unique thing? And that's the the hard part of like. I'm not public. trying to, I, and I'm, I'm not, I, I don't give any like negative no no scores just, to the movie. It's that's just, just something like to talk the, about. As as you discuss these things, that's what kind of makes it hard bouncing back and forth between Sony and MCU properties because they are. Uh, inevitably two different studios, uh, and they've worked well together. They've played well in the sandbox together. Uh, and so who knows how that'll that'll work out overall. So hopping in, we start out with with the the Gwen Stacy scene. Yep. How did you feel about them starting with that? So I definitely like the idea of starting from a different perspective. The first movie was really clever and kitschy in the way that they did some of the like, I'm Spider Man, the yep. one and only Spider Man, blah blah blah, and they just keep beating that trope, and it's so funny because it defies your expectations. Really good writing. The first movie was written well. This movie, I think, might have been written even better. Uh, just, they load up so many things. They deceive you. They earn your trust. They surprise you. It, it, it's a really well-written movie. So I, I liked the movie opening up with Gwen. I will say this. I did think, personally, the visual style is very cool. But I was like, I am not here to see this movie, yeah. this like watercolor, pretty impressionist movie. I'm here for Miles Morales. So while I appreciated that 
they the writers and the storytellers wanted to give us a different perspective and set up a almost second protagonist in Gwen Stacy, and I, I think that's what they're trying to do. You know, you see at the, the beginning and the end kind of bookend with Gwen's arc, uh, at least like towards redemption, the arc towards redemption, not how she gets it. But I came to this movie to see Miles Morales and his arc, how he grows up, because I'm here for Spider-Man, yeah. and I just thought they spent a lot of time there. I, I don't have an exact time on how long that scene was, but before you see the actual art card of Spider-Man from the moment the cr- the credits roll, that felt like a solid like five to six minutes of, yeah, of scene where lot, I'm like, let me cool, get to New York. There is a cool fight scene with the vulture in there. That It's a super dope fight scene, but you do spend a lot of time uh, – in that realm. I thought yeah, that yeah. the comedy of that, like you were talking about the writing, the comedy of that, her fight scene with the vulture is very that funny. Is cool. It's super like meta aware of art styles and, uh, and even jokes. Like if you have the very minimal understanding of different art styles, it, it's funny. Uh, yeah. but I do agree that it's like, all right, Gwen, like, well, so for, for me specifically, the very first movie, one of the things that's so amazing about it is the, animation style yeah. they had a really unique style and they're able to incorporate different types of animation style so i was so excited to see this movie because i want to see what they'd done to up the game and then they started with this very i wouldn't say it's not that it's bad it's it's not bad they're even using pink and purple and blue kind of the way that we use it here so yeah. i can appreciate that but they just spent too long where that's animation style, the way they wash out, it's much more a softer palette. The be- things in the background and the foreground are either very clear and then very kind of ephemeral and blue- blurry. I want to see more. So then when they get to the fight with the Vulture, which is like Leonardo da Vinci-verse, that was very cool to see different types of animation style on the screen. Yep, and then once together. we get to Brooklyn with Miles Morales, I'm like, okay, I'm back. I'm ready. I wish that they would have just got there quicker. So I was in. I'm sold on it. I like the story elements. I just think we spent a little bit too much time there at the start of the movie. If we want to go back there later and jump in between Spider Verses, that's what I came to the movie for. I just don't want to spend too much time. I want to. I want to meet my characters. Yeah, I think that there there's uh, a real struggle of do we do we build up Gwen or do we continue to get you to focus on Miles? But we've spent five years away from. Yep. This character without anything new, so get me to Miles as quick and as possible. It's almost, I, I say I don't give them negative points on their score or their rating because when you look at something like Multiverse of Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, I think something that struggled with that movie is they really focused on a, almost a singular Doctor Strange, but at the very beginning of that movie, they show you a different Doctor Strange. It's a very quick scene, and then we're bang into. Doctor Strange, that opening sequence works well. However, as a movie, they really only focus on like three Doctor Stranges throughout the course of the movie. And that didn't really feel like madness. Yeah, this movie, enough, however, yeah. focuses on a crazy, crazy number of Spider-Man characters. 288, 83, something like that. And it's very successful. So my criticism, I'm even acknowledging doesn't have the same weight as comparison like other multiversal movies like if you would have seen this movie as doctor strange multiverse of madness oh yeah you'd have cried so tears of joy it would be like the has never been better it's never it's gone away it's a good movie uh what about you so i really i enjoyed the art style i really liked it once we get in and he starts fighting spot i think that that's like a really yes. fun uh and then you like move into uh Mumbatan and just like instantly when you see the uh, India version of Spider-Man and the way he comes out and he's got his different style, he uses the yo-yo uh, style. So it's just so fun and it's just like a complete instant contrast to what we had already seen with, with Miles's character and from all of Into the Spider-Verse well, and that it's really I, eye-opening. Again, credit to the writing. Obviously, I'm aware of like Jason Schwartz and his voice who voices the, the Spot character. The way that they wrote the character... It feels like this clumsy idiot yeah. that is going to be the villain of the week. Bad guy of the week. We're going to defeat him. He doesn't know his power. He doesn't know what it is. And then very quickly we realize, oh, this guy is going to be a problem. Yeah. So that was just, that just surprised me. I had, I had seen the toys on the shelves for a long time. I've seen 
the Spider-Man 2099 action figure at Walmart oh, yeah, and yeah, Target forever. Toy. But I just recently saw the Spot characters to- toy on shelves at Target. My son loves Spider-Man. He's only four, and he loves Spider-Man. And he did not recognize that as a Spider-Man toy. I didn't recognize it. So when I was watching the movie, I even found myself thinking, I can't believe they made an action figure out of this guy because he's such an idiot. Yeah. But, hey, that's commercial marketing. They're going to make a toy out of everybody. And then so... When it turns out he's like, oh, this guy's way bigger than I thought he was. I was like, okay, this is really cool. So the writing really surprised me. I, I give a lot of credit. To yeah, the way that they they connected their stories. You go back to the, you have little scenes from the first one where he's linked to it. The guy that uh, Miles hits with a bagel when he's running away uh, connects back to they they both are involved in each other's origin story, which is he's the one that brought the spider to. Uh, that bit Miles to Miles's universe, and then Miles is the one that destroys the the collider, which makes it would be really the, cool to find out like if that was the plan all along, or if that was just a really well written, not retcon, but like a way to attach this oh, new yeah, story. Yeah, like Tim Lord and them. There, there's so many times where you hear from like George Lucas or Christopher Nolan. Oh yes, this was my plan all along. It's like sucker. Yeah, yeah. Your plan was not to end. The Dark Knight with Heath Ledger hanging from a building. Like, you had more story to tell. He was going to be in The Dark Knight Rises. Don't give me this bull crap or yeah. whatever. You were always going to do this. No. It would be really interesting to know, was that a thing that they did later on after the fact to connect them? Because the way that it's written, it feels seamless. like a perfect, yeah. seamless expansion so that the first movie can be its own narrative arc. It's a complete story from cover to cover that feels great. And then we open up book number two, and it unravels that book in such a way that number two was always meant to be. It is really clever. Yeah, it feels like we... That's the biggest thing, I think. The biggest um, flower you can give to this crew is the writing. It feels like all the characters have progressed in ways that if you watch the first one, especially recently, it, their their growth patterns feel authentic to the to the character. They don't feel forced into situations. So here's a question for you. We've reviewed, we've basically reviewed Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness without doing a show. We've talked about it because yeah. there's been so many multiversal stories. We reviewed everything everywhere all at once. Go see the episode. We've seen a lot of Spider-Man movies. We've seen Back to the Future, which talks about like time travel and all that. Multiverse is very much a theme right now across all different types of stories, all different things. You've got The Flash coming out that's got one. Do you feel like this movie benefits from having seen people like, do it right and do it wrong? Were they able to do it right? Or do you think it's just like part of it is also the medium lends itself well, both animation and Spider-Man. We're very familiar with who Spider-Man is. What do you think leads to this movie being so successful? Is it seeing people fail? Is it the medium? What, what do you think? Well, from like an on-screen perspective, they've been doing the multiverse before most people have it like been doing. I mean, they came out five years ago with Into the Spider-Verse and gave us a solid introduction into the multiverse in a way uh, that it's kind of silly that Multiverse of Madness later struggled with. Um, this movie coming out, the story was already written by the time that we would have seen um, everything everywhere all at once. So it's not, I don't think that they're necessarily benefiting from like them learning from any mistakes or the things good that the directors of that movie would have shown them. But I do think that they benefit from the audience having a better understanding of what the concept of a multiverse is and how these connections may work and how there's also some pitfalls with when you start to change things and what that does to uh, neighboring universes. Yep. So when you, when you call things canon events or whatever you want to call it, uh, the audience is easy to pick up on those things. So you don't have to have filler Spider-Man comics that everybody needs to read before they can understand what story you're trying to tell. Uh, now I've got like a basic elementary uh, kindergarten yeah. understanding of a multiverse. So, all right, let's move on with the yeah, story. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So we 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 both enjoyed. I think the art styles, the way that they oh, yeah. they move on. You 
everybody, every Spider-Man has their own kind of unique style. Uh, we would be remiss not to mention Spider-Punk. I think that that's one of the coolest things, the way they change their frame rate when he's on screen, the way that they change the whole animation around him. He looks like he's pulled right out of like magazines, like that punk rock uh, 60, 70 yep. style of like anarchy. Uh, it's just so cool. The voice acting in this movie is phenomenal. Very, very uh, good voice acting all across the board. Yeah, they don't phone it in at all where they have like one guy. Oh, it's Spider-Man. He can play all the spider No, they get a new actor for each different well, Spider-Man. And also, a lot of times, it's really easy in a movie like this to let's just go get like a Seth Rogen. Let's yeah. get a big name and voice them. We talked about this with Mario. There were some actors that did phenomenal and some actors that just did okay some actors that just like hey i'm here for my paycheck and let's let's phone it in there's a lot of really good voice acting in this movie that made it more believable oscar isaac who has been phenomenal in like everything i've seen him in so believable so much charisma even in this role i felt like the animated character was giving the performance not a voice actor and when those mediums blend well you've got all these different mediums different versions like the even like the lego spider verse the the lego universe you got uh i can't think of his name right now jonah jameson j jonah jameson what's his name actor oh the um, guy that does the farmers commercials yeah, i'm blank I'm blank- i can't believe i'm blanking on his name right now i love him so much uh he's got like uh initial name ck oh i was gonna say louis ck no no uh um gosh Pull it up because I'm gonna I'm gonna it's gonna bug me now that I'm I'm blanking on it. But I loved like J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons is like all across every universe, and he's still giving everything he can into those like little throwaway lines because his lines are in the, like the background. They're they're not in the foreground, and that's a testament to like good leadership and directorial vision to be able to get everybody to buy into how important they are. So I do think for his, especially his Lego one, is as it's taken from his Spider Man one audio already. So I don't know that they brought him in to record. They must have time. brought him to record something. Well, the Sinister some Six, yeah, 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 the Sinister Six one that he mentions whenever we're in the the new. World 42. Yep, yep. Uh, that's a new line. But the one when he's in Lego, I think, is just a clipping of his old yeah. uh, audio from Spider-Man 1 where he's like, make it a, a good picture this time, not a crappy one. Um, I think one of the, the, the things that they're hinting at and Gwen mentions is that every time a Spider-Man gets with a Spider-Woman it, or a Spider-Man gets with a Gwen, it ends bad. Do you think that they should pair them together as a couple at the end of, of the sequel? Or are you happy if they kind of go their separate ways? How do you kind of feel about that relationship? So this is a little bit of a theory of mine. Obviously in any kind of like movie that it would suggest that they're linking them together. They're foreshadowing what, what is to come or what, what could possibly be. And we also know from series like friends which is a totally different perspective. The Ross and Rachel relationship is hinted at for a very long time. Then it happens and it breaks apart, breaks apart. And we're always like fighting for them to get together. What if this, so uh, Miguel O'Hara talks a lot about these canon events when Miles disrupts Mimbatan's canon event for India Spider-Man. This police chief was supposed to die. That's what we always do. We're always supposed to deal with this. The police chiefs in our lives always die. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, we made the joke. It's also not good to be an uncle in a Spider-Man universe. No, no, no uncle. Don't be the uncle because no you're either a crime are, lord yeah. or you get killed by a crime lord. <laughs> and captain. And sometimes you're a crime lord that gets killed by a crime lord. Yeah, you don't want to be a captain, an <laughs> uncle, or a girlfriend of Spider-Man. Uh, but I think there's something to be said. I think in the next series, there's some couple obvious beats that are going to happen. But I think that Miles is going to surprise us. And the reason I think that is because the writers have surprised us in both these movies. So in Mumbatan, we learned that Miles is capable of doing things that other Spider-Men are not. He was the only one that could have saved that police captain. Others yeah. couldn't have done what he did. He was able to go further. Uh, and we know that this next movie is probably going to be him trying to save his father. And I wonder if maybe that's some way to set us up for his mom dying. Like, Let's surprise us. And so we've already been primed. Is there a thing where like he's trying to save his father and ends up 
like having to sacrifice Gwen, like some f- sort of like final destination type thing. Yeah, of it's, it's moved. Somebody's it's gonna skipped. die. It's Somebody has to die. Yeah. Somebody has to have a canon event, or is it this? This understanding of canon events that Miguel O'Hara has is not accurate. And Miles, he's the anomaly. He is an exception, and maybe he can define a new rule in this Spider-Verse where these types of things don't have to happen to where he can have both his father and his friend. Uh, But I do know this. She did lie to him about this thing. He is a an, ex, an anomaly, so in the generic storytelling, something has to pay to Transpire. be the yin and yang. Some, there has to be some sort of like pendants for this transgression, and whether that is Dread Miles being the Prowler and like them writing that wrong, you know, the universe itself seems to always like repair itself. And we talked a lot in like Back to the Future movies that Marty would do something to screw up the timeline and you have to do these things and it seemed like everything he would do would make it worse, make it worse, make it worse. But then the universe would kind of auto-correct Yeah, itself. self-repairing. It would self-repair itself. So I'm curious to see how the writers are going to do it. It seems very obvious that they're, that's the plot. And so because it's obvious, I'm like, that's not what they're going to do. But then they may do it and be like, man, they, oh, did, it. they did exactly what... Reverse chess, yeah, reverse uno. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, and, th- and that leads to a lot of like fun discussion of like, does Spider Man really have to lose somebody? It's part of why we love the character, but like, could they do it a little different this time? Uh, I personally think, looking into a little bit of a van fiction, I think that they're going to kill Gwen. I think they set it up when with a little foreshadowing by her talking about every time they get together with a Spider Man, uh, she di- something bad happens for one of them. Uh, so I think that see I would almost disagree. I arc. think that the emotional heart of this movie is the relationship that Miles has with his mother. Uh, there's yeah. some really catch moments that make you believe in like the frustrations and like the feeling. Tor- We've seen a lot of Spider Men that are torn between two worlds of their real identity and their superhero identity. And his mom in this movie, she's the one that is level headed with him. That's the way that Uncle Ben has been in these other movies. That's the way she acts in this movie. So to me, that almost makes me think, if you're following the Spider-Man formula, we've been led to believe it's Gwen, but it's, in my opinion, I think it's going to be his mom. Mom. I know she's, That's the, one his that, canon she's the one that dies in the comics, He's going to so. save his mom, and maybe he saves Gwen in the process, but the canon moment is maybe his mom passing in that whole transgression. So, and luckily we only have to wait one year to find out. All right, it's like nine months. Yeah. That's not even a full year, so uh, we'll know sooner rather than later. Uh, Moving on, how did you feel about the twist? Did you think that it was done well? Did you think, uh, were you, were you surprised or did you like catch the 42 on the screen? Because you, if you do pay attention in the movie, it shows you that he's going to world 42. It doesn't like show whatever his 936 or whatever it is on the screen and then swap it on you it it shows you where he's going uh so i have seen where some people are like twist there was no twist i saw it i saw it in the theater that he was going but i do think that most people aren't going to catch it i didn't catch it i think they did a couple of really good things to set it up so there's going to be some no twist it's happening so fast that sequence right before that where miguel o'hara is sending the spider force yeah after miles that is a don't breathe, don't blink, don't move, because you don't want to miss this. Great cinema. Great, great cinema. I'm not talking about animated sequences. I'm talking about cinema. Take that, Martin Scorsese. Yeah. It's really it's really good. It's really entertaining. And just the way that we think of Spider-Man always being the smart guy that's got a plan, it's cool to see him come up with a plan on the fly in the way that we've seen some other Spider-Men do that. So then when he gets sent back to 42, I did not see it coming. I realized it as, like, seconds before. I think that's good. So I'm able to, like, oh, my gosh, get ready for the reveal. Uh, And even, like, the writing when the mom was like, oh, you're Spider-Man? Who's that? Like that's such a funny line to like we think it's just oh it's just oh, the yeah, oblivious she's just being, mom like, cute or whatever she's kind of being silly and then when it pays off to like oh this and then when they show Prowler 
I realized immediately that's 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 Miles in this universe. Uh, I did not catch what you showed to me, and then what I later saw in the new Rockstars video that they showed us at the very beginning of the movie when they talked about Spot's introduction and the Spider Forty Two from Forty Two probably getting ready to bite Miles. I think that's cool to think that. That's why that spider bit Miles is because it was always going to bite Miles, just yeah. in a different universe. Yeah, that spider is so dumb; it didn't even realize it was in a different universe. Hey, why why would Miles. it? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's like the the way that. It and again, it's that's writing. writing that speaks to the the visual design that they put that right there. So then, when you go, it's just like Back to the Future. When you go and rewatch this movie again, and you start to catch these things uh, when it comes out at home, you'll be like, "Wow!" Like. They showed us the whole time. He's been. It was right in front of us, and we just and didn't catch it. What's cool is it's right in front of you the whole time, but it's not like something like The Sixth Sense, yeah. where it's like, oh, I watched it the second time, and oh, he, he was dead the whole time, of course. Yeah, this movie sucks now. Like, I don't want to watch it a third time. Here, it, there are so many Easter eggs on Easter eggs on Easter eggs. We talked about last week in our Spider-Man episode how you watch Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2 from Sam Raimi, and you're like, oh, there's some cool little moments, like yeah. paying attention to license plates. Uh, this movie is, if the Easter Bunny, like, was on crack. and yeah. just, This takes it to 10. Just, sure. like, it's there, they're everywhere. There's there's so many that... Pretty much every frame. I, I can't wait to watch this when it comes on to streaming, so I can just watch it, like, a couple of different times. One of my favorite Easter eggs, I didn't notice this until afterwards, was when they're in the parent-teacher conference and they talk about him getting a B, and Miles getting a B in Spanish, and his mother snaps, and you see the Puerto Rican flag. I'm like, oh, that is so good. Like That was so, so funny to me, and I didn't even realize it in the moment because it just looks like comic book. But to think that they're putting these thoughtful interactions throughout the entire movie, it just totally raises the rewatchability. I'm, I'm excited to see that more. Yeah, I had uh, I had several friends whose parents were primarily Spanish speakers, and I just remember them not getting great grades in Spanish and their parents <laughs> being so mad about it. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily for us, our uh, English-speaking parents don't get mad at us for not being that great at English. <laughs> my, my, my sister, funny story, my little sister, shout out to Casey. Uh, she learned Spanish before she learned English. So she is a Span she's a native Spanish speaker. We had a babysitter that watched us. And she taught her Spanish, and so she mm. would like be crying in the middle of the night, like in Spanish, and we couldn't, and we could, we didn't know what to do. We were like, I don't know what to say to her. We can't. Oh, she does. We have to call Lucy at like two in the morning. Lucy, what is she saying? And she talked to her, and was like, oh, she wants milk, and da 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 da. da. Uh, but then she like sucked in cl in school. We we're like, dude, you can speak Spanish better than the the teacher. Why are you getting a C in Spanish? And my parents would have, like, that was, like, the one big fight that she had as a teenager. Oh, uh, yeah. And it's, like, white people, very white people talking yeah. about Spanish. Well, it's even, I mean, even even uh, Miguel, Miguel O'Hara does it to Miles in the movie yep. when he tried to, to connect with him at the, the Spidey base. Uh, and he's talking to him in a little bit of Spanish, giving him some, like, empanadas and stuff. And he goes, like, super strict Spanish on him. And Miles is like, I don't really know what that means because it's not, like, the mm -hmm. the local dialect that, that Miles is used to speaking. And yep. uh, that's kind of the problem that people have is you, you learn it in school, and that's not how you talk when you get out into to real world. And so that doesn't always translate. Because uh, me and my brother had the same thing. We grew up. Uh, we had a nanny who was Spanish, and we knew how to speak it. And then we moved away. We we were born in San Antonio. We moved away, and then we both like my parents didn't keep speaking Spanish. I, I only Spanish. knew one word. I knew gaiate. Oh, and go. I remember being on a road trip with my parents, not in a minivan. We were in a truck, but we had a camper on the very back of the truck. So we had my sisters in the middle seat, and then I was up in the back. And my mom said something to me. And eight year old Brett looked right. At my mother's sweet brown eyes, and I said, "Cayete, mama," thinking like I said, I, she don't even know Spanish. Psh, she don't know nothing. She don't know nothing. And she said, "Rob, pull over the truck." Oh. And I knew immediately she can speak Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> and she took me out of the truck and she whooped my butt on the side of the road. And I got back in the car and I never spoke Spanish again. Yeah, you were like, I hate this language. <laughs> what have you done to me? I thought it was a romantic language. It is not. It's a spanking language. Yeah, kids, don't say gaiate to your mom. Yeah, that's a life I mean, lesson. I guess in some senses it could be romantic, but you know, <laughs> not that's that. For a different, that's for a different, uh, <laughs> different times. Um, so this movie ends on obviously a, a huge cliffhanger. Yep. Miles is in a different universe. Uh, Gwen Stacy's kind of been telling the story the whole time. 
uh, as she's, I guess, making her pitch to other spider people to, to kind of join the fight for miles. Um, as we move into what is, uh, kind of that waiting, that waiting time, this is the Jon Snow just got killed. This is the w- red wedding just happened. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, are you looking forward to the sequel? I'm very much looking forward to the sequel. I will say, I knew going into this movie that it was going to be broken up into two parts. I did not know how the story was going to play out or if it would be, we've gotten resolution on this story and now we're going to be launched. This ending, in a certain sense, kind of reminds me of The Hunger Games 3. How, like, the dome breaks at that and you're like, oh, okay, we're on a whole, and they're like, we're going to them. We're taking the fight to them. <laughs> Roll in credits. That feels a little more like this. It's much better executed. Yeah. Um, Way better than Hunger Games uh, 3. But just, er, like, this doesn't feel as complete of a story as its predecessor in Into the Spider-Verse, the, the first film. That's not, a, it's, it's a bad movie. It's a good movie. I'm not, just from a completeness of cover to cover, I don't know if it has the same connection completely now it is very circular and then we start with this really awesome drum thing from Gwen and we end with this awesome drum yep. thing from Gwen assembling her team so she was in a band solo now she's put the band back together so we're gonna see that fight we're gonna take it to miles we're gonna see the spider force led by uh, Miguel O'Hara and those spider people we're gonna see our spider team we're gonna see spot we're gonna see, see spot run like there's gonna be a lot that I'm excited for, uh, so I'm 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 in. Uh, I I do think one negative thing is I remember before this is a cross reference to The Walking Dead. I was a huge The Walking Dead fan. I loved the show, and when they introduced the character Negan, they're building up, building up, yeah. building up all season, and then they get to the final season finale where they f- are gonna kill somebody. And you can, you know, they got the music, the intensity, you've built up so much. And I'm here, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then they end the season on a, on a major cliffhanger. Well, then they had to spend the whole first episode, and even some of the second episode of the next season, building up that intensity. The final, like, 20 minutes of the film, I'm thinking to myself, in Across Spider-Verse, is this the end? Because the music is playing yeah, like this like is so the end. Intense, yeah. And I'm I'm in the moment. I believe it. I am feeding off the energy and it just keeps giving me more and it gives and gives and gives. I'm so thankful as an audience. You just member. keep taking. I got it. But I do wonder, this next movie, are they going to be able to successfully build that intention that intensity again? Because in Stranger Things, this last season, the second to last episode, you know, they got journey playing and it is like all right we're fighting Vecna yeah and then the next episode they start doing this like non the final episode is all this non-linear storytelling of like after the battle then back to the battle after the battle back to the battle and I thought that that last episode the pacing was kind of off so I mean these people have made two really excellent movies I believe in their ability to deliver but I want to see how they're going to build that intensity up because I was there I was like just give me more movie I'm I'm ready. Yeah, we do have the privilege of knowing that like these films were created and recorded and written at the same time, uh, so the continuity should be there. Hopefully, that flows well. But like just going knowing about movies, so does that movie start off immediately where it took off? Is it just like some Netflix shows know that you're going to be binging it? You're going to hit yep, skip to the next episode. Yeah. So does it start off right where we left off? Or do we have to do some like epilogue and all that? Do we that? have a time jump? Do we yep. have, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how they how they pull that going forward. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm obviously excited for it. I think my my main two complaints, and this isn't like breakers by any means because I love the movie, uh, are one, I get why they did it, but there's when you're setting up spot, you make him. It, it's when you want me to think that something is like super intimidating and powerful. If you beat him down at first, even though I get why they were trying to do it, it makes him seem like less of a threat universally, even as time goes on. Because then it's just like he's just like this loser of the week. Uh, a, a, a major example of this would be like Kylo Ren, where like he's like got his mask on and people are making fun of him for not being able to talk clearly. And it's like if you want me to think that this guy is a big bad, 
you have to show me and everything that he does because we have just such a short time with this character to show me him being kind of a loser. It's kind of my same problem with Kang and Ant-Man to show him being a loser in any capacity this early in the game forms a thought of who this character is in my head going forward. See, I, I think I might, I might disagree with you on that because when you look at characters like Kang or Thanos from other comic book properties, there we get to experience their story at where they are th- now, and then we get told through like flashbacks or storytelling where we then we see the f- old story of like wh- where they came from. So the origin is like how we how that happened. Here, I think we get told the origin of Spot, like how he became Spot, yeah. like uh, biologically or mystically, whatever his power is. But how he becomes like the threat is he gets embarrassed over and over again by Miles, who he feels created him. He literally kicks his own butt trying to just avoid him. And now we see he learns his powers. So we got to like see him. We didn't get to see Thanos become the Mad Titan. When Thanos shows up, he is the Mad Titan. Yeah. When We didn't get to see Kang become Kang. When we see him, he is Kang. So your, man. your uh, comments, I think, fit really well for Kang. Like, I don't want to see Kang get beat and then him be the ultimate big bad. Like, I've seen him lose, so I'm not afraid of him. Spot, we saw him become Spot. And even off screen, we're led to believe he's just learning how to use this power. We saw him not use his power, so he looks like an idiot. We saw him as baby Spot. But, but now he's, he's grown. I like when you that. you see a character get kind of beat up on and made fun of. Yeah, but now he's got like, depth. No, I mean, I, I get that. I mean, I'm not, I, I get what they the were rich, doing and why The they rich were experience it of. When you see Killmonger, he's a great villain. When you see Vulture, great villain in the MCU. But they show up and they are who they are and they just have they're written well yeah. and you have good conviction. When have we seen other characters do this? The only time I can really think of something like this, it from like the arc of the the villain is another Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man 2, when we see Edward Molina's Doc Ock where he starts off as this very passionate spider uh, s- s- scientist and he gets taken over by his AI, all that. That is like a really interesting arc, as opposed to like this evil man has evil plan, because yeah. that's kind of the Take very typical the narrative. Uh, and then my second kind of issue is is the lack of any real major resolution in this yeah, particular I agree with that. entity as a movie by itself. Uh, Why well, I, I like it, I know it's part one. It's still, if you want to talk about just how a movie kind of stands alone on its own two legs is somewhat hindered without a, a clear plot resolution in this story by itself. And it's important that they call it part one, not, you know, uh, number two. Yeah. Uh, this reminds me of my comments I made about Back to the Future, where, like, Back to the Future 1 stands alone on its own Merits. two legs. It is, it's a full story, it's complete. And then parts two and three really feel like one awesome movie. If you link them together, even though they're totally, totally different, uh, they tell the same beats and they're very derivative of each other. But when you connect them together, like we did, we watched all three of them. It made a really compelling image. So I think that this movie will feel better once we get this thing. But the same way, walking into the theater, I'm like, "Wow, it was really good." Where's the resolution for this specific yeah. story? It, it's not there. But we knew that going into the thing. Uh, I just would have preferred to see a little bit of like. Let me give you a little bit of resolution now so that you can be pacified for the next year. So I've got a quick game to play with you. Uh, This movie is often talked about, Into the Spider-Verse is often talked about uh, as being one of the the best superhero movies. Uh, Some people, it's their favorite movie of all time. Yep. uh, Which is arguably, I, I, I won't argue very hard with you about that. So I've got a couple of sequels, a few, that I'm going to name, and I just want you to tell me if you'd rather watch Across the Spider-Verse, if you if you think that it's a better movie, Across the Spider-Verse, or the movie that I'm going to name. Okay. So if you think Spider-Verse is better, Across the Spider-Verse is better, you'll just say Across the Spider-Verse. If you think the other movie is better, you'll just name the other movie. Just and I'll give, rapid I'll give, fire. Yeah, I'll give you rapid fire, and I'll give you a, a quick rapid fire explanation. I'm not going to talk about it too long. All right, so to start us off, we have what is often regarded as the best sequel of all time to any movie. Uh and I know that you haven't seen it, so I'm I'm setting you up for failure here. And that is the Godfather Part Two. Yeah, I've I've never seen any Godfather movie, uh, which is embarrassing. <laughs> I host a movie podcast. I've never seen the Godfather. 
So um, I'd rather see this movie because I wanted to see this movie. I have, yeah, this movie. All right, so there you go. I'm going to clip it. <laughs> Brett said Across the Spider-Verse Across is better the Spider-verse than Godfather Part 2. Across the Spider-Verse is better than Godfather Part 2, 1, or 3. Suck it. I don't know who directed it. I was going to say Martin Scorsese, but I don't remember. Suck it. Person that wants to be Italian. <laughs> Italianos. Okay, T2. Fugito. Terminator 2. You recommended it a few weeks ago. Or Across the Spider-Verse. T2. It's too iconic of a franchise, and it is the reason you care about Terminator. Yep. Toy this, <laughs> this movie is not why you care about Spider-Man, even though it's probably <laughs> it's it's definitely not why you care about Terminator. Movies, yeah. It's definitely not that. Uh, Toy Story 2. Across the Spider-Verse. The Empire Strikes Back. I'm not a Star Wars guy, so I feel like I have to. This, I said iconic for T2, so I feel like I have to say it for this. But like personally, I would rather watch Across the Spider Verse, uh, The Bourne Supremacy. I love Jason Bourne. If this was part one and part two of Across the Spider Verse, <laughs> I would say that. But I'm gonna go Bourne Supremacy. Okay. Uh, Back to the Future Two. Across the Spider Verse. Okay. Captain America Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier. The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight. And Toby Spider Man 2. Ooh. Across the Spider Verse. Woo wee. We're going to have to clip that. That's some I, interesting I think takes. So. I. I those are both really those being like superhero movies and Spider-Man movies. I guess that kind of gives away where I think it it fits in the pantheon of Spider-Man movies. Dude, we've been so lucky with the Spider-Man casting and like the stories that we've gotten from from our Spider-Man. Like we've been we've been lucky lately with like just the quality of movies. We were talking about this uh, another time of like we haven't really had a whole lot of clunkers, Mm-mm. and we we don't want to be like hot takes or like debate shows that they intentionally filter drama but we also don't want to be just like a vanilla everything is awesome we loved that movie that was really good you should check it out but for the most part we haven't seen many movies that were like yeah that's a that's a that's a crap movie we've seen a few they're like ah, that was okay it was a seven but we've seen a lot of good eight nine and we've even seen a ten we've seen a couple tens in the past six months so do you feel like we're in like a, a a golden age of movies. Like that sounds that sounds like a, a crazy thing Tarantino to say. Is coming after you but somewhere. like, <laughs> here we are. We have Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three that just came out, an amazing movie. We have this movie that just came out. Last week we talked about the Spider Man movies and Spider Man No Way Home. Like, I don't want to be a prisoner of the moment or give too much into recency, but. I said last week I thought that Spider-Man No Way Home was the best Spider-Man movie ever made. The week prior to that, I said that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was the best Guardians movie ever made. Now I'm looking at my notes and I'm thinking to myself, like, am I about to say again that this is the best Spider-Man movie ever made? I, I don't know, and I want to be honest with the with people that listen to this. I want to be honest with myself, honest in our discussion, and I just keep thinking, like, People keep saying there's a lot of comic book fatigue and we don't want to see these stories. And I'm like, I do. Yeah. I, I these are good them. movies. Yeah. We've had, we've, it's been a lucky year. I mean, so far, especially yeah. we had, you know, obviously what COVID was and then 2021 and then 2022, we kind of started to get some, some pretty solid movies, but this has been kind of just every month has given us one or two movies that we've pretty thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I don't know if it's just, People had all that like time on their the hands. Even the bad right. movies that we were like, oh, that was pretty good. Well, even like Renfield, which is a movie that neither one of us rated very high, we still had like moments where we enjoyed it. It wasn't like, oh man, we should have never gone to the theater. Uh, I mean, we did have the the benefits of a double feature, but we've just had like pretty overall solid quality uh, movies, and that leads me into my my van score for this movie which is this movie is a solid nine for me i really enjoyed it i loved it it's not as good in my opinion as the first one i knock it down a half a half a point i think the ambition is there 
I think they stepped up the the stakes, but I don't think it stands alone as a complete story like the first one. I think you can put the first one on any time, watch it by itself. It stands alone. It is a complete Spider-Man story. Both of these movies are complete Spider-Man stories. Everything that you think you know about Peter Parker, everything you think you know about the struggle Spider-Man has, this movie encapsulates that that this this series encapsulate, encapsulates that perfectly. Uh, to to where I fully am on board. Miles Morales is Spider Man. Peter Parker is Spider Man. They're both Spider Man. I'm cool with it. I love it. If you're gonna tell uh, a story from from superheroes being mantles instead of just the characters who they are, do it this way with just awesome writing, awesome storytelling, awesome visuals. I am going on record and saying we will never have better visuals than what Into and Across the Spider Verse have given us an animated movie. I don't. I don't think that we will ever top what they've done in the last two movies wow. uh, in the ex- in the existence of animated cinema. I think that this is as good as it gets. This is as awesome as it gets, and this is all you'll ever need from an animated genre. Bold text. You think, you think this has a chance to win the Oscar? The first one did. I think that the first one won will. the Oscar for animated film, animated feature. I think it. I think that it will. Okay. So let me ask you. Where do you think this? I, I think I have an idea. Where do you think this movie rates in your ten Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man movies? Uh, I actually just did it. Let me pull up my my ranking. I know that it is. Well, it's number four. It's right behind. That's it. That's it's right I behind it. uh, into. So, I'll give you my score. For me, this is a this is a nine point nine. Mm. I think it. And it very well could be the next time I see it a 10 or maybe it's higher because this movie gives and gives and gives. I totally agree with the concessions that you have with it as it relates to the the finality of this specific movie's story arc, which could pay off later. And a couple of things. It wasn't absolutely perfect to my personal preferences, but it was perfectly what the directors wanted. And we talk a lot on each episode about what our criteria is when we're looking at these movies. Directorial vision, story, arc, the production elements, the the production value. Everything that the directors wanted to accomplish, they did. And like you just said, they've taken someone like Peter Parker, who is synonymous as Spider-Man since the 1940s. And now they've made Miles Morales Spider-Man. There are people like my nephew that will grow up believing that Miles Morales is Spider-Man and they will think of Peter Parker like we think of Hank Pym or like you mentioned Adam West as old Batman. We'll think of Peter Parker as and that is crazy. I mean, the MCU or Sony, they have to be thinking about a live action Miles Morales. There's already been rumors that that's on, on, on the, the deck. If Sony does it, it'll probably suck. Or it'll be like decent, but not as good as something like the MCU would do. It's something that has to be thought of. Uh, for me, I find myself thinking, is this the best Spider-Man movie ever made? Obviously, I have a very special place in my personal heart for No Way Home because of like the nostalgia, the personal connection of dealing with my own like personal loss of my grandfather at the same time that Tom Holland's Spider-Man loses his Aunt May. So there's like a an akin relationship there. But I found myself watching this movie, Don't Blink, Brett. And I didn't want it to end, even though I could feel it ending for like 20 minutes. His eyes were so dry after. It was so, so good. I can't, I, I know it's going to be fun to rewatch. Yeah. I'm not excited to go wa- rewatch all the other Spider Man movie except for No Way Home. This one, I can't wait for it to be available so I can rewatch it. And I'm, I won't be surprised if it jumps, but for me, like in that in that pantheon of movies, it jumps above Spider Man Two, which I had ranked at number two, and it puts it squarely at two. So I've got No Way Home at one, uh, across, across the Spider Verse at two, Spider Man Two at three, and then Into the Spider Verse at one so, or at four. So I'm anticipating that this movie probably has the ability to deliver as the best Spider Man trilogy of all yeah. time. Obviously, they could fall flat on their face and, and it, it suck. But right now, they've got two movies in my personal top four. And if they deliver, I mean, it'd be really crazy to think if they had the one, two, four, or yeah. 
one, two, and five or one, three, five spots, that would be really insane. Yep, you're you're talking about uh, moving into top trilogies of all time if they can hit on. If they, Which if they is nuts three, for an in, for an animated feature. Yeah, that would be a, a really big accomplishment if they deliver like they've shown in these first two movies. Let's just assume that you walk out of the third movie with the same level of satisfaction you had with the first and the and the second. Is there an animated trilogy out there other than like a Toy Story, which is just really beloved? That but even like non animated is that has no. I'm saying like, w- do, Toy Story has this beloved quality that yeah. people really believe. Like I, I think Toy Story three is way better than one and two. I just love it. it. It delivers and it actually has like an emotional arc. Do you think that if this movie hits the way it has set up the first two, you walk out of that third movie? Is there another animated feature trilogy that rivals it that could be one of those greatest trilogies of if all time? It, if, it, if I walk out and that movie's nine plus, it is by far the best trilogy animated that I've ever seen. Easy. And it's right up there with any other trilogy non-animated live action that's beloved. So we're doing another trilogy episode next year when this movie drops yep. in March. <laughs> we are. And I, I mean, I'm so, I look so forward to watching the sequel and it, it may it may very well I gave it a nine it, when you connect it to the back end of that it may put that as a, yep. for me Infinity War booked with uh, in game is a ten it's a perfect yep. complete uh, See, and, but I think, I think it's that's actually a really good reference where like Infinity War ends somewhat on a cliffhanger but it does bring that story to a close he won yeah and this movie can end because you know the resolution to this specific battle. Our characters lost, and the the evil person won. Here, it, it's more we're left in like where he is, and it's it's really interesting, and yeah. it's shocking when you, as you're re, as the onion is unraveling, you're like, oh my gosh! But the story doesn't have like a a final resting place. We're just kind of getting ready to get launched back, and I think that there are people that. When you watch Endgame, my wife hates Endgame. Or my, my, wife, my wife hates Infinity War because of the way that it ends. She was like, oh. that was such, my nephew when surreal. Spider-Man is dusting away. I didn't even think about the fact that like he has a spider sense going off. He can feel what's about to happen. He can sense it. But my nephew watched that and I cried. What happened to Spider-Man? You're like, loser, don't you know that the <laughs> Spider-Man character makes so much money they're not going to kill him? So... That's just me, but I, I, I'm I'm excited to see where this is going to go. I think that these ten movies are such a fun watch. Yep. Like it, as we kind of bring this episode to a close and think about Spider Man as a mantle, as a character. Here we're going to have almost four different takes on Spider Man, and there's so many Spider Man takes in this diaspora in this movie. Yep. What do you think is your kind of takeaway ab- about Spider-Man leaving this this film? So as we talk about mantles for for what they mean to the character, we've we've had a lot of discussion on like Superman, for example, different ethnicities playing him. We've already got Captain America uh, with Sam Wilson. I don't think any character from their origin core lends themselves more to the idea of being a mantle uh, based off of how Stanley created him, which is it could be anybody under the mask than spider-man and i think that we're kind of seeing that now with miles with with gwen i like the character spider gwen uh ghost spider whatever you want to call her i think that he that's the perfect one and they're making it work and i think that's the reason that it does work is because it could be anybody under the mask there's not anything inherently special about spider-man on his own stand standalone uh but he's doing the right thing and anybody can do the right thing and that's what i i love about the character and kind of where we're at now with him and Miles. Yeah. What about you? I guess my, my closing thoughts as we think about this specific movie and the universe of spider movies that we've seen, I can't go a whole episode about talking about Across Spider-Verse without mentioning Donald Glover and his cameo in this oh movie. Oh, my gosh. So good. Uh, Donald Glover is probably not as handsome as, like, a Jamie Foxx, but he's equally as talented. Like, he can do everything. Yep. Whatever he wants to do, he can do it, and... This movie uses that cameo as well as like flashbacks in the background from other movies that we've seen in a way that is both an Easter egg but actually adds value to the film. Having Donald Glover as the Prowler in this movie, he's in there for maybe six seconds total. Mm -hmm. 
but it makes the movie better. Usually cameos are like, ah, hey, look, there's Bruce Campbell. I oh, hey, look, there's this actor. Yeah. Oh, hey, look, the there's Xena a... Warrior Princess. That's cool. This it actually makes the, the story better. It makes the movie better. And I think, well, that's really cool. It makes me wonder, there's a, another Spider-Man that we've seen in the past uh, navigate the multiverse successfully. Is there a chance that someone like Miles, our, our Miles, could need help from Tom Holland's Spider-Man in this next movie? And, you know, they find a way to work together, even if it's just a moment to, like, yeah. that's an easy way to pull a Miles into the MCU. It's a very natural progression. I don't know if Sony wants to do that. Uh, but I think when I think of Spider-Man and what it means, last week I said Spider-Man always comes back. No matter who is under the, the mask, he always finds a way to come back. He always finds a way to deal with loss and win. And I think as you think about the ripple effect across the Spider-Verse, I just think of like that th theme for life. The inspiration is it only takes one cons one event to change the trajectory of Spot's life and turn him into a villain. It only takes one small thing to change Miles B. Morales, who has dreads, to become Prowler or Spider-Man to where... It only takes like one small action for me to change my life for the better. It only takes one moment, one little thing that I can do, that you can do to be better. And I think that's what Stan Lee wanted us to take away from Spider-Man is that he's everybody. Anybody could be Spider-Man. Anybody could make one small change in their life and have a ripple effect across their entire destiny. So I don't want to be too like Hallmark or Sing Songy about it, but it reminds me today, tomorrow, like go out. Be the best me I possibly can be. I don't have to shoot webs out of my arms or with my web blasters or whatever to make a difference and have a, a lasting ripple effect across the, the, the multiverse. All right. I, I don't think I could have said it better myself yeah. uh, if I had said the exact same thing that you just said. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys for riding along with us. Don't forget to check out uh, Avatar The Way of Water this week so you yes. can be ready to be primed, uh, be have the, have the gas tank full so you can hop along and uh, listen to the next week's show and, and not feel kind of lost in that uh, situation. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe so that way we can get to our, our 100 and you can be entered for that movie on the mini. Yes, I'm excited. Yep. Peace. Peace.